Hi, I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now! Our journalism is powered by you, not by any corporation or government. That means we count on your support to produce our daily news hour. Please make your donation of $5 or $10 or more at democracynow.org. Every dollar makes a difference. Thank you so much. This is Democracy Now! The time for negotiation uh, to end the war in Ukraine is now. This is becoming uh, quite apparent to European leaders like President Emmanuel Macron of France and Chancellor Olaf Scholz of Germany. Uh, it seems it's uh, also becoming uh, part of the uh, administration's internal debates. As Ukrainian drones attack deep inside Russia, while Moscow continues its assault on Ukraine, Ukraine's civilian infrastructure, we'll look at growing calls for negotiations to end the war. We'll speak to Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Then. It's election day in Georgia. We'll talk to Cliff Albright of Black Voters Matter about how Georgia's new voting restrictions have impacted the runoff between Senator Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker. SB202, the Georgia voter suppression bill, has already had an impact both in the general election and especially in this runoff election, first and foremost, because they reduced the runoff period down from eight weeks down to four weeks, and they made it impossible to register any new voters for the runoff period. Plus, a story about press freedom, hacking, surveillance, and a secretive Israeli spyware company. A group of journalists from the Central American news outlet El Faro have sued the NSO group after the company's Pegasus spyware was used to hack their phones. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Ukrainian drones have struck two Russian air bases hundreds of miles from the front lines. On Monday, Kremlin officials acknowledged the attacks damaged two Russian warplanes and reported three people were killed and five others wounded in an explosion at a military base about 150 miles from Moscow. Russia responded with a fresh barrage of missile strikes across Ukraine. That that knocked out power supplies and killed at least four civilians. The attacks triggered air raid sirens across Ukrainian cities and towns among those seeking cover in a Kyiv bomb shelter Monday was the UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk. There was a wave of missile attacks against Ukraine, including some of them ending up in the proximity of Kyiv. You can imagine what this means for the population. It has become almost a new normal, but it has a huge impact on civilians, and it's, it has to stop. On Monday, Russian state media broadcast images of President Vladimir Putin touring the Kharkiv Bridge, a key link between Russia and the Russian and next Ukrainian territory of Crimea, which was heavily damaged by an explosion in October. In other news from Russia, President Putin on Monday signed legislation making it illegal to promote or praise LGBTQ relationships or to express non-heterosexual orientations, including in literature, film, television and websites. Here in the United States, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments Monday in a case brought by a website designer from Colorado who's seeking to deny services to LGBTQ plus people. During two and a half hours of debate, the court's conservative majority appeared to side with the plaintiff, who said her religious beliefs ought to outweigh Colorado's public accommodations law, which bans businesses from discriminating against people based on their gender and sexual orientation. Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser, who led the defense, spoke to reporters outside the Supreme Court. We are very concerned that if our side loses in this case, the court would open up an exemption that would make possible all sorts of professions, photographers, people make cakes, others who write books, to say, I'm not going to sell to someone based on who they are. The court has never recognized an exception, and to do so would threaten the core of our civil rights laws.
In immigration news, the Biden administration's expanded temporary deportation relief to tens of thousands of Haitians after mounting pressure from immigrant rights groups. Haitian migrants who arrived in the United States as of November 6 will now qualify for temporary protected status, TPS, and the program's expiration date has been extended from next February to August 2024. Biden officials warned asylum seekers who arrive after the November cutoff date will likely be deported. This comes as Haiti faces a political, economic and humanitarian crisis with skyrocketing violence taking over the streets. In related news, U.S. senators have reportedly drafted a last-minute bipartisan immigration bill that could grant a path to citizenship to at least two million undocumented people brought to the United States as children known as dreamers. The Washington Post reports Republican Senator Tom Tillis and Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema have reached a deal on the bill, which would also increase funding to further militarize the U.S.-Mexico border and try to speed up portions of the asylum application process. The Centers for Disease Control is encouraging all U.S. residents to resume wearing high-quality, well-fitting masks in public, as 44 states report very high rates of influenza. This week, hospitalizations from the flu hit a 10-year high for this point in the flu season. Rates of RSV, or respiratory synctial virus, are also high in many regions, and as U.S. hospitalizations from COVID-19 are once again climbing. In Illinois, 12 counties are recommending masks in public after reporting high levels of community spread, while in California, Los Angeles County officials are poised to restore a mask mandate after COVID cases reached their high highest levels since August. In northern Ethiopia, the commander of the Tigrayan forces says two-thirds of troops have relocated away from the front lines a month after a ceasefire agreement ended fighting in the war-torn region. This comes as Ethiopia's military has been accused of massacring Tigrayan prisoners of war captured during the conflict. The Washington Post reports at least 83 Tigrayan soldiers in a makeshift Ethiopian prison camp were slaughtered by guards in November 2021, with their bodies dumped in a mass grave by the prison gate. Other witnesses report reported Ethiopian guards have killed imprisoned soldiers in at least seven other locations. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, government officials said Monday at least 272 civilians were killed in a massacre blamed on the M23 rebel group in the eastern town of Kishishe last week. DRC security forces initially estimated some 50 people were killed. M23s denied responsibility. Dozens of young activists gathered in the city of Goma on Monday, demanding justice for the victims and denouncing the international community for ignoring the intensifying violence faced by people in the DRC. We find it inadmissible that the international community is passive in the face of the ignoble acts that are perpetrated in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We say no because it has been more than a decade. Our populations are massacred in the Rochuru territory and Bunagana. People are still living in disaster. We say no. Al Jazeera has filed a formal request at the International Criminal Court asking it to investigate and prosecute those responsible for the killing of Palestinian-American journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. On May 11th, Israeli forces shot Shireen in the head as she was reporting just outside the Janine refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. Shireen and other reporters were wearing blue helmets and blue flak jackets, clearly emblazoned with the word press. Shireen's niece, Lena Abu Akleh, spoke to reporters from The Hague in the Netherlands earlier today. Important that there continues to continue to be uh, support for Shireen. We continue to talk about her and to continue to pressure uh, governments, members of uh, parliament, uh, policymakers uh, to take action and pressure those in power. Uh, to seek justice and accountability. To see our interview with Lina Abu Akla and Sharif Abdel Kadus, the the producer of the the correspondent on the documentary The Killing of Shireen Abu Akla for Al Jazeera last Friday, go to democracynow.org. 
in Mongolia, thousands of people took to the streets of the capital, Alambatar, on Monday, braving the freezing cold to protest allegations of corruption within the state-owned coal mining company. Reports recently surfaced accusing a group of Mongolian lawmakers with ties to the coal industry of stealing billions of dollars. Meanwhile, people are suffering through a worsening economic crisis as inflation and living costs have soared since Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the closure of borders that have impacted Mongolia's trade with China. On Monday, protesters tried to storm a government building, calling for Mongolia's parliament to be dismissed and for our corrupt politicians to be brought to justice. And that's the reason why a lot of government members are richer and living luxurious that life than, like, uh, the citizens. And how they could just be, like, so calm when the citizens are, like, buying bread, like, by slice, not by the loaf. So that's the, why, that's the reason why I'm protesting today, for the good of the people. Back in the United States, Georgia voters are casting their final ballots today in a runoff election that pits Democratic incumbent Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock against Republican Herschel Walker. Two of Walker's former romantic partners have accused him of pressuring them to have abortions, even though he's an avowed abortion opponent who said during the campaign he would ban abortion, even in cases of rape or incest. And last week, a third former partner accused Herschel Walker of violently attacking her. Senator Warnock spoke from the campaign trail in Atlanta Monday. My Angelo says when someone shows you who they are, believe them. We don't believe anything Herschel Walker says, but he's shown us who he is. He's certainly not a United States senator. Later in the broadcast, we'll go to Atlanta to speak with Cliff Albright, head of Black Voters Matter, on this election day in Georgia. Here in New York, a judge has dismissed the murder charge against domestic violence survivor Tracy McCarter, a nurse and grandmother, who was arrested in 2020 after her husband died of a stab wound when she defended herself during an altercation. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg declined to move forward on the case after he'd said, while running for office, that, quote, prosecuting a domestic violence survivor who acted in self-defense is unjust. The judge left the case unsealed for 60 days to give Bragg the opportunity to seek further other charges. Bragg's office says it's reviewing the decision. McCarter said in a statement Friday, quote, I'm innocent and I'm devastated that on March 2nd, 2020, a man whom I loved lost his life. We were both the victims of the cruel disease of alcoholism. Dismissing the unjust charge against me cannot give me back what I've lost. But I'm relieved that this nightmare is over, and I'm determined to once again thrive, she said. To see our coverage of the case, go to democracynow.org. And in labor news, at least 17 University of California academic workers were arrested Monday after staging a peaceful sit-in in the lobby of the UC president's office in Sacramento. Hundreds of other academic workers led a march at a separate University of California building in California's capital as their strike entered its fourth week. Some 48,000 academic workers across all 10 UC campuses have walked off the job demanding living wages and better working conditions. To see our coverage of the largest strike of academic workers in U.S. history, go to our website, democracynow.org. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners across the country and around the world. Well, Russia has accused Ukraine of using drones to attack two air bases hundreds of miles inside Russia and an oil depot near the Ukrainian border. One of the air bases reportedly houses Russian nuclear-capable strategic bombers. While Ukraine has not publicly taken responsibility, a senior Ukrainian official told The New York Times the drones were launched from inside Ukrainian territory with help from Ukrainian special forces on the ground near at least one of the Russian bases. Russia Russia responded to the drone strikes by firing a barrage of missiles across Ukraine. This comes as millions of Ukrainians are bracing for a winter without heat or electricity due to Russian strikes on Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. Meanwhile, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, recently accused the U.S. and its NATO allies of becoming directly involved in the war by arming and training Ukrainian soldiers. We turn now to look at calls for negotiations to end the devastating war. Last week, during a state visit to the United States, French President Emmanuel Macron repeatedly said negotiations are the only way to end the fighting. The only way 
to find a solution would be through negotiations. I don't see a military option on the ground. That was French President Macron on 60 Minutes. He also told ABC negotiations with Russian President Vladimir Putin are still possible. He knows very well Europe, US, the U.S., and so on. He knows his people. I think he made mistakes. Is it impossible to come back at the table and negotiate something? I think it's still possible. Last week, President Macron held a joint news conference with President Biden at the White House, during which Biden said he would consider sitting down with Putin to end the war. I'm prepared to speak with Mr. Putin if, in fact, there is an interest in him deciding he's looking for a way to end the war. He hasn't done that yet. If that's the case, in consultation with my French and my NATO friends, I'll be happy to sit down with Putin to see what he wants, has in mind. He hasn't done that yet. A day after President Biden spoke, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz spoke to Vladimir Putin for an hour by phone. To talk more about the war in Ukraine and calls for negotiations, we're joined by Jeffrey Sachs. He's the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University and president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He has served as advisor to three UN secretaries general. His latest piece is headlined A Mediator's Guide to Peace in Ukraine. He's joining us from Vienna, Austria. Professor Sachs, welcome back to Democracy Now! Why don't you lay out your thesis, your proposal for how this mediation can happen. We see there's a serious shift here. I mean, Macron, with Biden at the White House, it was the first state visit um, to the White House under the Biden administration um, of any world leader. And clearly, this was a major subject of their talks, both um, Macron being a back channel to Putin, but also then President Biden himself saying he would speak with Putin. What do you think needs to happen? I think both sides uh, see that there is no military way out. I'm speaking of uh, NATO and Ukraine on one side and Russia on the other side. This war, like von Clausewitz told us two centuries ago, is politics by other means or with other means, meaning that there are political issues at stake here, and those are what need to be negotiated. What President Macron said is absolutely correct, that uh, President Putin wants political outcomes that, in my view, absolutely uh, can be met at the negotiating table. Uh, just to quote uh, uh, what uh, Macron said in another interview, he said, one of the essential points we must address, meaning we, the West, as President Putin has always said, is the fear that NATO comes right up to its doors and the deployment of weapons that could threaten Russia. Much of this war has been about NATO enlargement from the beginning. Uh, and in fact, since NATO enlargement to Ukraine and Georgia were put uh, on the table by President George W. Bush Jr. and then carried forward, carried forward by the U.S. neocons basically for the next 14 years, this issue has been central and it's been raised as central. But President Biden, uh, at the end of 2021, refused to negotiate over the NATO issue. But now is the time to negotiate over the NATO issue. That's the geopolitics at stake. There are other issues as well. But the point is, this war needs to end because it's a disaster for everybody, a threat to the whole world, according to European Union President uh, Ursula von der Leyen last week, 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died, 20,000 civilians, and the war continues. And so this is an utter disaster, and we have not searched for the political solution. What's interesting, Amy, and I would emphasize it, is that inside the U.S., we're finally hearing about this. President Biden's statement was very consequential, but the week before that, perhaps as notable, was the statement of the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, who said, now is the time 
to negotiate. What we see is a big debate inside the administration between the neocons on the one side, and I would say those who see reality on the other side. Victoria Nuland, uh, probably our neocon in chief in the administration, who's been part of this NATO enlargement from the start, uh, said, no, can't negotiate. But others are saying, you know, it's really time. So this is a debate within the U.S. as much as it is a question of sitting down between the United States and Russia. And, and Jeffrey Sachs, you've uh, mentioned that uh, there are four core issues that you believe need to be negotiated. Uh, you've written about these, not only the issue, obviously, of uh, NATO enlargement, uh, but also the issue of uh, protecting Ukraine's sovereignty and security, and also the fate of Crimea and the future of the Donbass. Could you uh, uh, talk a little bit about those other issues, especially the fate of Crimea? Because most Americans and the media in this country do not really cover the historic relationship of Crimea uh, to Russia and its uh, military importance to Russia. Yeah, Juan, thank, thank you very much. From the beginning, it, it, from before the beginning, uh, from uh, 2021, when Putin made clear what the political issues at stake were. But I happen to know this goes back uh, in many ways back to 1990, 91. I was at that point an advisor to the economic team of President Gorbachev and then later President Yeltsin and Ukrainian President Kuchma. So I've watched this from the start. There have been a few very important political issues at stake. One is the NATO enlargement. I think it is really the dominant uh, issue. But three others are extremely important. Uh, of course, uh, I should say equally important is Ukraine's sovereignty as a, as a sovereign country and in need of security arrangements. But NATO as Ukraine's security doesn't work. Uh, it's, it's, it's an explosive brew. So one needs to find, as President Zelensky himself said earlier this year before backing off from it, that there needed to be a non-NATO way to secure Ukraine, and there can be. So that's another uh, crucial issue is Ukraine's sovereignty and security in a non-NATO manner. The third issue that is very consequential is Crimea. Crimea, the peninsula, uh, people can look on the map, uh, the peninsula and the Black Sea, has been the home to Russia's naval fleet in the Black Sea, and therefore completely consequential for Russia's uh, economic and uh, foreign policy and military security since 1783. So this is, from Russia's point of view, uh, a, a, an absolutely core issue. And incidentally, in 2008, when George W. Bush Jr. was very unwisely pushing NATO enlargement, President Putin said specifically to President Bush, in Bucharest at the time of the NATO-Russia meeting, that if you push NATO enlargement, we retake Crimea. This was already explicit. And the point is that for Russia, this is vital. Now, after what happened, of course, in 1954, in a symbolic action, because there was a Soviet Union at the time, not, uh, not separate nations, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the uh, chairman of, of uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the chairman of the Soviet Union, transferred Crimea from Russia to Ukraine. It, it didn't mean much. It was a celebration, a 300th anniversary of a treaty that uh, Khrushchev celebrated by this administrative transfer. It became consequential after the end of the Soviet Union and the independence of Russia and Ukraine. There was a delicate balancing act for many, many years, uh, especially in the early 2010s. Then President Viktor Yanukovych was negotiating with Russia to give a essentially a long term lease to Crimea to satisfy Russia's security desires and needs as a as a balancing as a as a delicate balancing. But the United States 
very unwisely and very provocatively contributed to the overthrow of Mr. Yanukovych in early 2014, setting in motion the tragedy before our eyes. And that ended that delicate balance. Russia said Crimea has to be ours because we just saw that we can't depend on a long-term arrangement with Ukraine. The United States contributed to the overthrow of uh, a Ukrainian president who was negotiating with us over this core issue. So my view is that, and almost everybody uh, that discusses this in private understands, Crimea has been historically and will be in the future effectively, at least de facto, Russian. And this cannot be the cause of World War III. We have to understand the centrality of this. We have been told about the centrality of this basically explicitly since 2008. The last issue on the table is a real issue, and that is the ethnic divisions within Ukraine itself, given the complex history of this region and the piecing together of uh, all of the, the countries of this region from various uh, times in history, Ukraine itself is ethnically divided. On the Western part, it's ethnically Ukrainian, but complicated there too. But on the East, which is the Donbas, uh, Lugansk and Donetsk, the two regions that are the center of this war, uh, these are predominantly Russian, ethnic Russian, Russian-speaking, Russian Orthodox. Uh, and after Yanukovych's overthrow, the place where uh, it, a, a paramilitaries uh, demanded independence uh, of these regions uh, or joining Russia, and Russia supported those uh, paramilitaries. And uh, autonomous or independent states were declared. What happened, and this is crucial to understand, is that in 2015, there were agreements to solve this problem by giving autonomy to these uh, eastern regions that were predominantly ethnic Russian. And these are called the Minsk agreements, Minsk I and Minsk II. And in particular for Minsk II, the Europeans, especially France and Germany, uh, said, we will be guarantors of that. But then Ukraine, under the post-Yanukovych uh, regime, two presidencies, uh, Poroshenko and Zelensky, refused to implement the Minsk II agreement, saying they're dead. We don't accept them. We don't accept autonomy. Russia said, well, <laughs> you had a diplomatic agreement and now this is violated, and this became another cause of this war. And we need a resolution of the Donbas issue as well. Ukrainian sovereignty, no NATO enlargement, de facto Russian control over Crimea, some kind of solution like Minsk II, uh, some kind of autonomy, some solution for the Donbas. These are the four pieces that can save Ukraine spare Russia, save the world from what is a growing disaster. And this is why we need Jeffrey a pragmatic Sachs, approach. Jeffrey Sachs, if I can, uh, if you could briefly talk about how uh, we're hearing virtually every week of a new announcement of more U.S. military aid and, and, and economic aid to Ukraine. How is this a constant stream of weapons and and a buttressing of the Ukrainian government, uh, either helping to end the war or helping to prolong it? It is prolonging it, definitely. And I think both sides miscalculated. Uh, Putin calculated that the initial invasion would push Ukraine to the negotiating table and these political issues would be resolved. And frankly, in uh, March, after the February invasion, there were negotiations, there were exchanges of documents. The mediators, uh, the Turkish government, said we're coming close to an agreement. Indeed, both sides, both Russia and Ukraine, said we're coming close to an agreement. Then the Ukrainians walked away from the negotiating table. We don't know the full story to that. My own uh, guess 
is that the U.S. and U.K. said you don't have to uh, compromise in that way. There was a U.S. project for more than a decade to expand NATO. And I think there were forces in the administration that did not want to give up that project. And so Ukraine backed away from the negotiations and the war went on. Now, on the U.S. side, the calculation was that NATO weaponry, the HIMARS and others, combined with very tough economic sanctions, combined with freezing hundreds of billions of dollars of Russia's assets, combined with what the United States expected to be a worldwide agreement to isolate Russia, believed that this would bring the Russian economy to a state of collapse so that Russia could not continue to prosecute the war. This was also a serious miscalculation. Most of the world did not go along with the Western sanctions. Even in these votes in the United Nations, if you weight by the country populations involved, it's 20% of the world or 25% of the world that has voted against Russia, but most of the world not. The economic transactions of Russia with China, with India, uh, with uh, many other parts of the world have continued. The Russian economy has absolutely not collapsed. Russia has not run out of armaments. We have uh, even reports today that some of these missile attacks have been uh, identified by uh, intelligence experts as newly manufactured. Uh, so this is not uh, only the uh, old stockpiles. So the Western calculation was wrong as well. Russia did not collapse. Neither side collapsed. We entered a war of attrition. To simply pump more money into this in an open-ended way right now is disastrous. It just means tens or hundreds of thousands of people killed more in addition to the 100,000 uh, or more already dead among Ukrainian forces. It means continued disruption to the world economy, which is uh, taking its toll all over the world. It's clear we need a political outcome. Neither side is going to win militarily the way they expected. The costs of this war are brutal. And what the administration is trying to do is put in another $40 billion without any real debate because it wants to put it in an omnibus piece of legislation at the end of this year that has to be voted up or down, not on the Ukraine issues, but on the overall keeping government open issues. So we're not having that debate in Congress that we really need because the opinion surveys are showing that more and more Americans say something's not right. Tens of billions of dollars, people dying, massive economic disruption. Where are the negotiations? And that's the real debate we need in Congress. But the administration's trying to stick in another $40 billion without that debate taking place. To be clear, Professor Sachs, you've denounced Russia's invasion as violent uh, of Ukraine. I'm, I'm sorry, Amy, I You've missed the opening. You've denounced Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Of course. It's it, absolutely, this was a collision that is disastrous. And the cruelty of the Russian invasion is enormous. But the foolishness, recklessness of the U.S. neoconservatives to push to this point is also something that needs accounting. Finally, because, Professor Sachs, who sure. would negotiate? Who would be the mediator that you're talking about, or mediators? We have 30 seconds. Clearly, uh, the Turks are extremely skilled. This is their region. They've been deeply involved. Pope Francis, the U.N. Secretary General, the U.N. Security Council, uh, of course, which includes all of the major actors, all of these can play a role. But I would say Turkey, as a leader in the Black Sea region who knows all the participants, can, can do this. But this is not negotiation between Ukraine and Russia. This must be between the United States and Russia over the NATO issue, as well as Ukraine and Europe over the security issues that are so much at stake and, of course, Ukraine's core interests. 
Well, Jeffrey Sachs, I want to thank you so much for being with us, economist and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. His many books include The Ages of Globalization and A New Foreign Policy Beyond American Exceptionalism. We'll link to his new piece headlined A Mediator's Guide to Peace in Ukraine, as well to the last interview we did with him, also in Austria, at democracynow.org. Next up, a story about press freedom, hacking, surveillance, and a secretive Israeli spyware company. We'll speak with one of the journalists from the Central American news outlet El Fado, who have sued an SO group after the company's Pegasus spyware was used to hack their phones. Then we'll talk about today as Election Day in Georgia. Stay with us. The Quiet Temple by Booker Little and Donald Byrd. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we turn to look at a story about press freedom, hacking, surveillance, a secret of Israeli spyware company. A group of journalists working for an award-winning Central American independent news outlet have filed a lawsuit in a U.S. court against the NSO group. That's the Israeli company that operates Pegasus Spyware, which has been used to monitor and track journalists, human rights activists, and dissidents across the globe. The journalists suing the NSO group all work for El Fado, which is based in El Salvador, perhaps the oldest exclusively online Latin American newspaper. They allege that malicious Pegasus surveillance software was used to infiltrate their iPhones and track their communications and movements. The journalists believe the Salvadoran government and President Nayib Bukele were behind the surveillance. The lawsuit, which was filed by the Knight First Amendment Institute, states, quote, the attacks have compromised plaintiffs' safety, as well as the safety of their colleagues, sources, and family members. We're joined now by two guests, Carrie DeSell, senior staff attorney at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. She's the lead lawyer in the lawsuit. And Roman Glessier is a French-American staff reporter with El Faro English. He's one of 15 plaintiffs in the lawsuit against the NSO group. He's joining us from Guatemala City. Um, Roman, let's begin with you. Tell us what you found and why you joined with other reporters for El Fado uh, to sue the NSO group. I'm so sorry. I, I was having some audio interference. I didn't hear you. I'm just question. asking why you sued the NSO group, what you found on your phone and the consequences of that for you and your fellow reporters at El Fado. Yeah, so there were there were fifteen of, including me, of fifteen members of El Faro who decided to bring this suit. There were twenty two of us in total who tested positive for for Pegasus on our phones, and that's in a broader context where the Citizen Lab and Access Now found as many as thirty five people who were um, surveilled using Pegasus between um, roughly June twenty twenty through November twenty twenty one. And El Faro in particular, uh, t being that 22 of us were infected, it was uh, the most uh, systematic and, in, in the words of the, C the Citizen Lab, shocking uh, case that they had reviewed of um, Pegasus infections in, in one, focused on one organization. In my case, there were, there were four attacks um, against, against my phone in May and June of 2021 while I was uh, doing investigative work in El Salvador. And uh, one of the reasons that, or I would say the main reason that we decided to bring this suit is because of lack of legal avenues to obtain 
accountability in El Salvador, which is why we're turning to uh, U.S. courts, given that some of the servers that would have been used for these attacks are based in the U.S., and we're hoping to, um, we're asking the court to also um, order NSO Group to reveal its client. We're, we're of course, of the belief that uh, it was the government of El Salvador who engaged in these attacks. This is weapons-grade um, software that is sold exclusively to governments. And actually, throughout the course of the investigation, we discovered, or the Citizen Lab discovered, um, a live infection in one of the devices that allowed them to ascertain that the infection on that device was um, was carried out from El Salvador, which was an unprecedented case for them. And But we also believe that it's NSO's obligation to reveal its client and that they cannot hide behind a, a, a shroud of um, arguing that this should be uh, protected knowledge uh, or protected information that is of uh, that's you know national security. Um, so we believe that they should be uh, required to reveal who is their client concretely. And Roman Gracie, uh, uh, could you talk about the con uh, increasing restrictions on press freedoms in El Salvador? And weren't some of the some of the investigations that El Faro working on were uh, uh, linking uh, uh, President Bukele to uh, uh, to some of the uh, street gang violence uh, in El Salvador? Yeah, um, that's that's exactly you're you're exactly right that the um, infections against El Faro essentially formed. Uh, a map to understand um, not only our investigative work, but major political events in the country. Uh, so we received a list of infections, basically just dates, just raw data. And then from, from there, we were asked to fill in the blanks with what we were doing at that time. And we published an, um, a, a special on this or an investigation on the, on the findings of the report, where you can see the graphics where um, essentially it lines up with major investigative reporting. Um, and one of the most emblematic uh, cases, this is actually the month where uh, we were most surveilled by Pegasus. There, was, there were a total of 149 infections in the month of September 2020. And what was happening at that time was at the beginning of the month, El Faro published an investigation that revealed for the first time to the public with uh, internal government documents and, and other proof that uh, the Bukele administration had been negotiating up to that point for up to a year uh, with MS-13. Uh, subsequent investigations found that it also included uh, both factions of 18th Street gang. So, but at this point, the first installment was was uh, focused on on MS-13 for a reduction in homicides. And uh, the, the 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 level of homicides has always been a, a sort of not only brutal day-to-day um, -day experience of Salvadorans, but also a sort of political barometer in, ter in terms of how people measure citizen um, security. And so the, the investigation was uh, very uh, politically, um, it, it was a hot button for, for that reason. And so the, the revelation of this uh, happened in September 2020. There were the 149 um, confirmed infections in that month alone. And, uh, or sorry, um, cumulative days. Let me just uh, correct that. There were 149 cumulative days of, uh, of Pegasus infections against a variety of reporters. And um, toward the end of the month, Bukele himself on live television basically accused the newsroom of, uh, well, he asserted that uh, the newsroom was under investigation for serious money laundering. And I'd like to bring in Carrie Desell, also from the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia. Uh, this uh, this idea of a lawsuit filed in the United States uh, when uh, the the violations or the surveillance occurred uh, in El Salvador. Could you talk about the legal basis for that? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, so we are bringing this lawsuit in U.S. court because the the bulk of the value of the spyware that was used against Roman and his colleagues at El Faro derives from its ability to infect as many smartphones as possible around the world. And that really relies on uh, the U.S. infrastructure of U.S. technology companies. In this case, NSO Group abused the software and services of Apple, based in California, in order to create an exploit that served as a vehicle for the delivery of the spyware to Roman's cell phone, to his colleagues' cell phones, and to many other Pegasus victims around the world. So this case and the cases of many other victims of Pegasus has a, a, a very important nexus to the United States. 
Um, and Apple itself has sued NSO Group based on the same underlying facts as uh, those that support the case that we are bringing against NSO Group here. I'll just add to that that El Faro has a very significant readership in the United States, hundreds of thousands of readers uh, in the U.S., and a significant uh, majority of those, uh, or at least plurality of those in California as well. And the Pegasus attacks that were launched against El Faro were a clear effort to intimidate uh, this important news outlet into silence. And so the, the effect of these attacks would be to uh, diminish the ability of those of us in the United States who look to El Faro for uh, independent news coverage of Central America. Uh, Carrie, the lawsuit asked the court to require NSO Group to identify return and then delete all information obtained through these attacks, to prohibit NSO Group from deploying Pegasus again against the plaintiffs, and to require NSO Group to identify the client that ordered the surveillance. Talk about especially that last part. Who ordered this surveillance? That's exactly what we want a U.S. court to order NSO Group to disclose. Uh, the other key value of the services that NSO Group provides its clients, um, you know, secrecy is, is one of the most important pieces of that. So NSO Group tells its clients that the spyware that it, uh, that it offers them to use against whichever targets they choose cannot be traced back to those clients. And in this case, although there's a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest that the government of El Salvador was behind these attacks, uh, we don't have proof of that yet. And so one of the most important pieces of relief we're seeking through this lawsuit is an order requiring NSO Group to identify its previously undisclosed client here. And that would send a signal to other government clients around the world that they can no longer rely on NSO Group's assurances of secrecy when they seek to use NSO Group spyware to uh, intimidate and persecute journalists, civil rights activists, human rights activists around the world. Roman Gracier, I wanted to ask you about a related issue. The prominent investigative Guatemala newspaper, El Periodico, has shut down its print edition after months of attack and harassment by the right-wing government of President Giamate. The paper's president and founder, José Rubén Zamora, remains in pretrial detention for many months now, accused of money laundering and extortion charges denounced by human rights and press freedom groups as political retaliation over exposés of Guatemalan government corruption. The paper, founded in 1996, unclear how it will survive just online with reduced staff. In a final editorial column written from his prison cell, Zamora, who's been a journalist in Guatemala for decades, wrote, it's been 30 years of struggle against corruption and impunity, against governmental abuses and terrorism in favor of freedom, transparency and accountability. You're talking to us from Guatemala City. How is the repression against journalists and government critics worse enough? not only in Salvador, uh, under Bukele, but across Central America. Yeah. So the, the Guatemala case, uh, Guatemala is advancing similarly to El Salvador. It's hard to reduce or to you know, compare which one is, is more severe, I think. Um, definitely across Guatemala, what we've seen over the past year is that, and, and even two years, is that there has been systematic abuse and in, including criminalization um, of journalists. You could point to the El Estor um, mining case where reporters from Prensa Comunitaria have been uh, summoned to court and, and otherwise criminalized. And of course, the case against Jose Rubén Zamora, who uh, just before they published their last daily print edition on November 30th, uh, the, the, the day before, I believe, he um, had spent four months officially in pretrial in pre detention. And if I'm not mistaken, the first hearing um, that he'll face in his in his case in or for uh, for the trial is is set for December 8th, uh, which is this week. And um, it's also another aspect of what's going on in, in Guatemala is that the challenges facing journalists outside of the capital can often be more challenge, challenging because they're not only um, dealing with the central government, but they're also dealing with uh, municipal authorities. And, and others who are looking to criminalize them uh, in different ways. And you could point to, for example, the case of Anastasia Mejia, who was reporting on um, the local mayor, and she, she faced um, potential—she was jailed briefly for her, for her work. And uh, could you explain, or uh, how, do you, uh, how do you analyze the fact that a person like uh, President Bukele, who's a 
uh, by all accounts, a extreme right wing populist, has been uh, has so much high approval rating uh, you know, in El Salvador. What, uh, what what do you attribute this to, and what's been the role of the media uh, in shaping that public opinion? Well, I think it's certainly true. Everything, uh, all of the pol public polling that we have uh, over the past few years has pointed to very high levels of support for him. And I think that part of it comes, uh, part of his political appeal um, from the onset has been his ability to communicate effectively with the public uh, that he wants to, uh, that his political project represents uh, an alternative to the lack of other political parties. And, and that's not to say that, um, you know, there have, of course, been, there's been an abundance of uh, corruption investigations and other things, but it's more about the, the, the public perception of, of his communication. And, and it's been um, very, very positive. Uh, finally, uh, Carrie Deso, we just have a minute, but I wanted to ask you about Julian Assange. The New York Times and four major European newspapers, The Guardian in Britain, Le Monde in France, Der Spiegel in Germany, El País in Spain, all have urged the Biden administration to drop all charges against the WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange. In a joint letter, they said this indictment sets a dangerous precedent and threatens to undermine America's First Amendment and the freedom of the press. The letter ends with the words, publishing is not a crime. For those who don't know, Julian Assange faces 175 years in a U.S. prison on espionage and hacking charges for exposing U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq if he's extradited from Britain. The five publications partnered with WikiLeaks in 2010 to report on documents leaked by Chelsea Manning. Um, the significance of these major newspapers, including The New York Times, demanding the Biden administration drop these charges. Yes, I, I think this letter reflects a clear understanding uh, by the press that the charges against Julian Assange threaten freedom of the press. The uh, prosecution of Assange for soliciting, obtaining, and then publishing classified information would uh, set a clear and devastating precedent in the United States that could be applied to any of these organizations, journalists going forward. Um, it. it is a significant threat to the work of national security reporters and investigative reporters who rely on leaks of government information to report on issues of utmost public interest. Carrie Dassault, I want to thank you for being with us, senior staff attorney with the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia and the lead lawyer in the El Fado lawsuit, and Roman Glessier, El Fado English reporter, plaintiff in that lawsuit against the NSO group. And we'll link to it all at democracynow.org. It is Election Day in Georgia. We'll be back in 20 seconds. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We end today's show in Georgia, the final day for voters to cast ballots in the closely watched runoff between Senator Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker. A victory for Warnock would give Democrats a 51st seat in the Senate. Despite a new voter suppression law, almost 2 million Georgians cast early votes. This is a record in Georgia state history. Two of Walker's former romantic partners have accused him of pressuring them to have abortions, even though he's an avowed abortion opponent who said during his campaign he would ban abortion even in cases of rape or incest. Last week, a third former romantic partner accused Herschel Walker of violently attacking her. For more, we're joined in Atlanta by Cliff Albright, co-founder and executive director of Black Voters Matter, which has, as they say, been driving the blackest bus in America across Georgia. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Cliff. Talk about the significance of this day and the record-breaking early voting, though you're still deeply concerned about who has been disenfranchised. 
Yeah, good morning, Amy. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean, we had record-breaking uh, early vote turnout. There's good news and bad news in that. You know, part of that is clearly that's largely the result of the incredible organizing of all the groups, all the voting rights and voter mobilization groups in the entire Georgia ecosystem. So shout-outs to all of our coalition. But we also have to acknowledge that part of the reason that it had to be record-breaking almost every day is because we were squeezing into one week of early voting what usually happens in three weeks of early voting. That was the result of SB202, the famous Georgia or infamous Georgia voter suppression bill that they passed last year. They designed it with surgical precision to reduce the runoff period, to reduce the number of early vote days. They even tried to get rid of Saturday early uh, early voting, but luckily because of uh, the Warnock campaign and other groups, that was squashed by the by the courts. And so, you know, we're, we're uh, happy around the, t the type of turnout and enthusiasm that we're seeing. But we know that we got to be cautious in looking at, at some of that, that one-week turnout because, again, that was a function of, partially a function of the voters' pressure. And if Herschel Walker does lose the runoff, what do you feel his Senate campaign will represent in terms of 2024 and years to come? As we're seeing the Rep National Republican Party seek to recruit more and more conservatives of color to run for office in an effort to, to uh, siphon off uh, some of the historic Democratic vote in the African-American community and in Latino community. Yeah, you know, um, that's that's honestly that's not so much of a concern of ours, right? If by some uh, chance Herschel Walker w were to win today, it wouldn't be because of, of any large number of black voters that they were able to siphon off uh, because there was a black Republican running. If anything, you know, most of the people that we talk about are, are actually insulted by the fact that the Republicans went out and found out just any old black face to throw into the race, or more specifically, that Donald Trump found any old black face to, to throw into the race. More black voters are actually insulted by that than being um, encouraged to, to come over and vote for the other side. Keep in mind, this is a candidate who quite literally, literally just yesterday or the day before yesterday, two days ago, he took pride in being called a coon, right? Uh, this is what he said, right? That a coon is a is a smart animal. And so he was he was fine with, with being uh, associated with such. And so, you know, most black voters aren't, aren't falling for that. If, if Herschel Walker does well, it's going to be because of, of the white community who quite honestly, you know, he talks about being a vampire or a werewolf. 49% of Georgia would probably vote for him if he actually was. Was a werewolf simply because he has the Wait. Republican R after after his name. You raised the werewolf. Uh, this is one of the most amazing ads, I think, in campaign ad history. It's Raphael Warnock's ad, but it's only the voice, except for the very beginning. We're going to play a part of it right now, of Raphael Warnock saying he takes responsibility for the ad. Go. I'm Raphael Warnock, and I approve this message. You ever watch a stupid movie late at night, hoping it's gonna get better, don't get better, but you keep watching it anyway? Okay, I've seen this video. The other night I was watching this movie, I was watching this movie called Fright Night, Freak Night, or some kind of night, but it was about vampires. I don't know if you know <laughs> vampires are cool people. What the hell is he talking about? <laughs> is he serious? Is he for real? A werewolf can kill a vampire, did you know that? I never knew that, so I didn't want to be a vampire anymore. I want to be a werewolf. Yeah, y'all serious about this, right? So I've been telling this little story about this bull out in the field what? with six cows. And three of them are pregnant. There's no substance. There's nothing. So you know you got something going on. It makes me want to laugh, and then it makes me think we're in trouble. So that's the Warnock ad, but those are the words of Herschel Walker. In this last, mi last minute, we have Cliff Albright. Um, if y y This race is so significant, but you think a Supreme Court case is even more significant about elections that's going to be uh, t that's taking place tomorrow, or arguments. Yes, um, thank you, Amy. Yes, the Harper Moore uh, case that is going to be argued tomorrow, which is a case that deals with whether or not state legislatures will have sole authority in deciding their election laws, even uh, su surpassing not only federal law, but even the, their own constitutions and their own state courts. And we know how important this is because we've seen that in some of these states over the past couple of years, it's been the state courts that have stepped in to curb some of the, the voter suppression, to curb some of the gerrymandering that we've seen taking place. This would give these legislatures, uh, you know, just uh, complete control 
separate from the democratic process, this could be literally, without exaggeration, this could be the final nail in the concept of democracy in this country if these state legislatures are able to run uh, rogue, rogue without having any kind of accountability. And, of course, we'll continue to cover that. Cliff Albright, co-founder and executive director of Black Voters Matter. A very happy birthday to Democracy Now!'s Igor Moreno. And I'm so glad to be back from Egypt, because I get to go to Juan's next two talks. He just gave one last week. We're posting the full talk online at democracynow.org. But this Friday, Juan Gonzalez is giving one of his final farewell talks at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies at 3 p.m., speaking about 50 years of of defending and chronicling America's workers. That's Friday at 3. Monday at 6.30, he'll give an address on Latinos' race and empire at the CUNY Graduate Center. Go to democracynow.org for all the details. Juan, I can't wait to see you there in person. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.